afternoon session and uh, excited to see what these young athletes can uh, lay down for this afternoon. Ruby doing a good job up here in the Zoom Flume section. Again, modeled after the famous Ice Canal. Getting stuck up against the wall, unfortunately. Drove out too hard on four, above five. And uh, it's just going to have to reassess, get back into the eddy. Hopefully not come in contact with gate six, because that will nullify gate five. And she is driving back up there. But just while she's getting back up into the, the swing of things, we're here in Montgomery, Whitewater, the banks of the Alabama River in wonderful city, Montgomery, Alabama, state capital. And... Uh, had the opportunity to drive around and walk around a little bit, jump into some of the local businesses, experienced a, a wonderful couple of restaurants and a really, really nice ho hospitality from the uh, some people in the, uh, in the local community. So excellent opportunity to check it out and I've uh, been having a great time here. So Ruby's finally getting underway, kind of getting out of that Zoom Flume section. Took her a little bit more time than it needed to, but that's just... The name of the game, sometimes with these less experienced paddlers, they're up here, uh, you know, challenging themselves at the Olympic trials. It's a high-stress race. Even if they don't really feel like they're going for Olympic berths, they are still in uh, in Olympic trials, and that brings an element of stress that uh, any young paddler is going to feel. And they want to perform well. They want to present well in front of their crowd, in front of their family, and, and do well for their coaches. So Ruby here just taking her time, setting up for this big cross move. Gives us an opportunity to talk about the course, talk about some of the features that we've got out there. And this amphitheater in the middle of the course has some just wonderful flow. It's it's not nearly as surgy as some artificial courses can be. It's got a very controlled feel to it. Flips over, oh, almost flips over, but saves it. Just about tucks back in 14. And I think Ruby is just, you know, feeling her way down here. Top half of the course is, is giving her some troubles, but she just needs to get to the bottom. So we kick off at the top section. We've got a, an awkward and very challenging uh, offset section of three gates through one, two, and three. Four is an upstream. And then a, a wonderful, interesting, like, out into the current, dive back into the eddy move, five and six for a quick cross over to, uh, over to seven. And we've got Ivy there, just coming unstuck. Bit of a bit of a roll. She's trying to find her way back up. She's upright. And that's good to see that young paddler just getting herself back upright. And that's not uh, not necessarily optimal. Um, I'd love to see her stay upright for the entire run, but she's just taking some really deep breaths there as she drives back out, crosses a little too high down into 13. You're going to see a lot of paddlers struggling with this middle section today. 11, 12, and 13 is really, really powerful. And you have uh, this challenging hole. It's got a, a big curling shoulder on it that can really um, throw the boat around. And that's just something that the athletes have to contend with. Every single course has some different features. And the course designers have put uh, the gates in very unique positions to challenge the skills of these athletes, just like Carden coming down here from North Carolina on the Natahala River. And Carden's an up-and-coming junior in the U.S. ranks, so she's, actually you can see Ivy there in the distance. Looks like Carden is really driving forward. Excellent work through the center hole in gate 13. And she is moving aggressively downstream. Got just an ever so slight breeze here in Montgomery, so the, you will see the poles just shifting around just slightly. Nothing too crazy, um, but that is going to play into it. We will see some dancing poles that the paddlers have to navigate. She does an excellent job of driving out through 16. Uh, you can see Ivy's just pulled off, letting her through. Looks like a slight touch on 17. Just didn't quite get the paddle out of the way. Great cross at 18 and 19. That was glorious. A really, really good paddling from this young, young junior who's really just putting in strides. We've got Emily LaRiche from Charlotte dropping in at the top of the course right now, in through four, taking her time to make sure that's set up. She didn't drive in too early, as many of the competitors have. It can get you caught out. I don't want to say the word greedy, but sometimes the uh, paddlers can get a little over-anxious. Drive in too early, and that eddy will just spin them out. Emily, unfortunately doesn't quite get through five so has to reassess drive back out into that current and uh, 
And now she navigates that well. Back to six. And Emily, one of these young paddlers, her brother Ian is also competing, coached by uh, Wes Bolliard, also out of Charlotte. And uh, these guys are just gaining experience. They've not been paddling for a very long time, so they're really still just honing their skills. And unfortunately, that zoom flume section of Montgomery is just proving too challenging for Emily on this run as she works her way back to, uh, to gate seven. There she goes, just sedately finding her way through. And then you've got this middle section. So after the, the flurry of activity from gates one down to seven, start coming into this flatter section of the course, speed of the water mellows out a little bit. It doesn't make it any less challenging. The gate course designers have put this awkward offset eight through 11. that sets you up not the best way for the amphitheater section. And Emily is opting to sort of swing across to river right. Her momentum is taking her that way. It wasn't going to work in her favor to try and drive back left. So she's just taking the opportunity to set up over there. We'll take the surf back across that middle wave over to the upstream on gate 12. And these athletes are negotiating this 22 gate course in gate order. Uh, you have uh, red and white gates are upstream gates. So paddlers must pass below them and then drive back up through them and the green gates are downstream gates where the paddlers can just paddle downstream through them but those are often the more challenging ones chasing her down though we've got Ashley Knee uh, Ashley has been on the circuit for a long time she's taken a few years out and uh, it appears that she's coming out of retirement a little bit maybe to try and stake her claim back on the US team unfortunately her results this weekend are not indicative that uh, She's necessarily back where she wants to be. I think there's going to have to be some assessment of work that she needs to do to, to get back to the U.S. team level. The, uh, some of the younger competitors that have been training extremely hard in the last few years have put leaps and bounds on. And Ashley's just uh, kind of left out there a little bit. It's going to have to do some work. But she's working her way through 17. Comes into contact with that outside pole. Lifts the bow a little too much. In through 18, still got some of that old skill as she drives through to 19 and back up to the top of the course. This is Olivia Spencer. Olivia has actually been interning with Stacy Hep, the race director for the U.S. Olympic team trials for canoe and kayak. And uh, this young paddler from Colorado wanted to get involved, get back to the sport that's been giving her so much and that she enjoys. And so she's been working hard here in Montgomery, helping organize, helping set everything up. And, uh, assisting Stacy in uh, setting up the event and I must say it is quite the event as well we've been treated to a phenomenal facility excellent amenities and uh, the support and effort from all the volunteers and and uh, race officials has been spectacular so really enormous thank you to all the volunteers that are here on site we've got gate judges We've got locals that are learning about the sport, helping scribe. You can see one of those judges standing right there above Olivia, making sure that she's going through the gates. And that's gate judge is going to have to determine whether that was her shoulder that touched that pole or not. Mark it down, and then that's all passed back electronically back to the chief official so that we can determine their score. Now those touches that we just talked about, adding two seconds of time for any gate that's touched. Now, if you touch it twice, it's still just one touch, but those are going to add two seconds. And if you completely miss a gate, they're going to assess you a 50-second penalty. And if you're looking to win, then any missed gate, any 50-second penalty is just going to basically take you out of contention, and you're going to have to completely redo it on run two. Now, these athletes are on run two. This is... Uh, the last opportunity this weekend that they have to um, have to actually uh, put down a banger of a run. We've had some paddlers not do what they want so far and uh, kind of leading it out for the, the two women that are competing for that Olympic berth in K1 for the women is Evie Liebfarth and Rhea Sribar. Now, Evie is definitely 
a couple steps ahead right now. She's in the driver's seat. Rhea's got a lot of work over this weekend and then the next time in Oklahoma City in two weeks to uh, kind of take control. But uh, as I said earlier, Evie is just really, really in control and Rhea's left Rhea a lot of work to do. You see Olivia just pulled off, obviously got into some trouble in that middle section as Lucy Crino comes down here into this bottom section of the course. She's doing an excellent job. I've actually never come across Lucy before. I've never seen her paddle in the wild and um, a lot of the paddlers I am familiar with, but Lucy has just been crushing it all weekend. Very controlled paddler and uh, it's been wonderful to see what she's able to do. Uh, it really is encouraging to see the depth of junior talent that the U.S. women have got coming up. Uh, their coaches should be immensely proud. Uh, this is a wonderful example of them. This is Isabella Altman out of D.C. Uh, her and her sister have been putting on an absolute masterclass of what junior paddling should be, and they are very controlled. Uh, and it's, it's been wonderful to see the, the development over the last few years. But these two Altman sisters doing an excellent job. Isabella just keeping the boat running. They're not panicked. Um, they, they really do seem to have some excellent boat control and have obviously got wonderful fundamentals. Gets a little stalled up there coming into gate 12. That 11 to 12 move is very challenging. Uh, it's really easy to come across with too much boat angle and then the eddy will just stall you out, spin the boat in a direction that you don't want. So playing the, uh, the margin there, it's just very fine. The line is fine. And that was glorious. Now, Isabella just crushing this bottom section of the, the course. Doesn't look like she's working too hard, but she has this very smooth style, uh, kind of very deliberate, and uh, it's just a pleasure to watch. Really like it. Has to go for the spin, not a bad thing. Uh, didn't quite get the sweep to get a bow downstream through 17, but still a very good move for her. She adopts it, unfortunately, just getting a little unstuck there on 18, and her sister coming down, Marcella, Beautiful running through gate four. That's one of the hardest moves to get right. It's very easy to come in too early and get too close to the gate. Beautiful run. Goes for the direct move on six. And you just a couple of flurry of strokes. She's a, you can see her sort of moving her weight back and forward as she figures out that center of gravity to ensure that she's on that wave. Really interesting to see these bodies and paddlers reacting in real time instinctively to, uh, to where the boat is versus the white water and that nothing but hours of practice and training it's going to substitute for that comes in a little high gets stalled up on the eddy just what i was talking about it's easy to get that bow upstream she handles it well doesn't lose too much time unfortunately doesn't quite get the drive out of that and that's put her late on 13 so now she's going to have to loop back around and uh it looks like that middle section just coming a little unstuck you kind of see the cascading effect of errors that unfortunately Marcella was victim to in that run. Now she had a great run earlier on this today. Um, not bad at all. And she gets back on track. This, so she understands that this probably isn't going to be her best run. But she is back. You can see her firing now. She is determined to make this bottom half of the course how she envisioned it. And she'll be looking to take away confidence that. Lovely little adjustment to the stroke there. Can she go for the sweep? Beautiful direct move. That was lovely as we have Lois Betteridge from Canada. Now, obviously this is the U.S. Olympic team trials, but we do have some Canadians and some uh, and a Kiwi joining us for this competition, just for some competition practice and also an opportunity to gain some time, being time, throwing down full runs with the stress of a competition. Now, they don't factor into the U.S. trials. They don't affect that, but uh, they, they are racing for their own glory and their own uh, experience. So Lois being coached here by James Cartwright and Michael Stancheski making short work. Oh, struggling to get over to gate 13. Doesn't quite get out of the eddy as far as she wants. She did dip her head. My angle of that was marginal at best, but the judges of which there are multiple out there on each gate will have a better view than I do on the camera. And so they'll be able to determine whether her entire head went through that gate line. Now, I mentioned it a couple of times, but you do have to get your entire head and boat through the gate at the same time for it to count. And that's what those judges are out there to determine. Beautiful little run through there. Turns up, unfortunately, a little too much. Has to recheck her angle, drive out of the stopper feature on 19, 
And that was a lovely little run. Back up to the top of the course, we've got Rhea Sriba. She has everything to gain right now, unfortunately. She is a little bit behind Abby Liebfoth for the Olympic spot in this category. So she has to just lay down an absolute heater of run. She looks like she's really going for it. Rhea out here with her coaches. Um, Raffle Smolin, who's coaching the U.S. team, and her father, Rock, very experienced paddler in his own right. And Rhea is ripping through this middle section. She knows that she's just got to lay down the best run of her life in order to qualify for this spot. Leaves that pole swinging. A beautiful entry. Kind of close, though, to gate 12. So that two-second penalty, if the judges give it to her, might hinder her. But she is flying. She means business because she knows that this is the run that counts. She doesn't have any other opportunities. She is ripping through here. In through 16. Quick sweep up. Driving out of there. You can see the gritted teeth as she's surfing that wave. Big sweep. No issues through 17. Does that very, very well. Last couple of moves. Now, this bottom section of the course... You think it doesn't matter. It is very difficult. Excellent move across the whole 18 to 19. And she is flying. I really hope that she manages to complete that run well. While we are joined back at the top of the course by our current leader, Evie Liebfarth out of Natahala, North Carolina. Evie is just a new phenomenal paddler. She's out here with her father. She's been an absolute demon on the junior ranks. Getting world title after world title. She's medaled in her first competitions at World Cup level in the senior ranks in C1. And she's out here in K1 and C1. Notice a very familiar font pattern on her helmet. Kind of a unique and recognizable helmet pattern of one of her sponsors. And she is just ripping through this middle section of the course. She's got an incredibly high work rate of strokes. Beautiful little move. Checks up that angle. That was glorious. Wow. She means business. She knows that this, while that she's in the leadership, she can just lay down an absolute legend of a run because she's got nothing to lose. She's in the leader's spot. She knows that she's got a huge advantage. She is crushing this course. Man, Evie is just looking to assert her dominance all over this field. And she knows what she's capable of. Beautiful little duck through 17. Just dives the paddle out of the way. This is glorious. I mean, that is brilliant to watch. Has slight checkup, adjusts her body, sweeps through 19. I'm so happy to see this sort of run. This is exactly what this paddler is capable of. And I know that she'll be looking to work on her skills as she goes to Paris. This is just fantastic. Spectacular paddling. And uh, that was a run for, the, run for the ages. That was glorious. Luca Jones from New Zealand. Now, she doesn't factor into our... Olympic team trials, but she is out here racing. Luca's a very experienced paddler from New Zealand and trains with her coach, former U.S. Olympian Michael Smolin, and she has a silver medal from Rio in 2016. So even the fact that she's here gives Evie a wonderful benchmark of what she's working for. Now, after first runs, Luca was in first place, but I'd be really curious to see what Evie just threw down on the uh, the second run because that was a dynamite run from that young lady let's see what she's up against Luca just rolling through this uh, this middle section and you can see the style that Luca has is slightly less dynamic than Evie Evie's very very aggressive there's uh, a lot of a lot of strokes Luca's a little bit more sedate but very powerful you know and, uh, and you can see, wow, that's a beautiful move at 17. Just the, the strength and composure. She takes her time to the key move at 18. That just little weight does get hung up on the exit, though, unfortunately. So that's going to cost her just a fraction of a second as you see her down, go down. And we have Luca Jones finishing up, sprinting down to the finish line. Luca will be very happy with that run. It, it looked like a very composed run. I wouldn't say that it was necessarily the most dynamic. You can just see how much effort they put into these runs. <laughs> she throws her head back, takes a big gulp of air, and uh, and can rest easy for a second. And uh, it looks like the results are coming in. 
at the U.S. Olympic team trials for canoe and kayak. And the uh, this is the racing that we came for. And uh, let's see whether Rhea's done enough to get back on on target. Um, gonna gonna say there might be a, there we go. There was a slight technical delay, but. Evie Liebfarth just crushed it with her second run. Jumps ahead of Luca Jones, who did put down a heater on her first run. But Evie leaps into first with a time of 106. And that really was a dynamite run. Uh, she is going to be so happy with that. I know that um, that's going to come really close to cementing her position as the K1 woman going to the Olympic uh, Games in Paris in 2024 and I can imagine the smile on her face and the smile on her dad and her mum's face is just going to be beaming and uh, very very proud of that run. I, mean, I uh, had an opportunity to chat to her father Lee at lunch and uh, you know, cheekily asked him given the fact that she was sitting in a pretty spot let's see something special you know she can hang it out there and uh, whether whether he passed that message along or not but she she really hung it out there. That was a glorious run, and she has won the U.S. Olympic team trials here in Montgomery, Alabama, for the first major event that this venue has hosted. Uh, that that was a really, really good performance and a pleasure to watch. Uh, really do want to thank all the athletes for putting in as much effort as they, they have, but probably the biggest shout-out goes to all the parents for the support that this sport takes, the travel, the time, the effort. It's just like any other sport that children are involved in and these young athletes are involved in that you know 99% of the support comes from the uh, from the parents and you know every once in a while the you know they get a little extra support but uh, it's the parents that do the heavy lifting and uh, never take away from that that support so I know Lee and Jean and uh, the lead fast are going to be very happy I think Rhea however, she did put down an absolute heater of a run on run two. Uh, she'll be very happy with that. Probably a little disappointed that she's still back behind Evie, but she can look at that run and be very, very proud of herself. She has been paddling exceptionally well over the last few months and years. As we have Mihal Smolin, our Mish, previous Olympic medal or Olympic paddler for the U.S. team. He is. An absolute phenomenal paddler. His father, Raffle, who you can see there in the white shirt, walking along on the bank, is the U.S. team coach and has been his coach since he was a wee whippersnapper over in Charlotte. And Mihao, absolutely phenomenally skilled paddler. He won yesterday by quite the margin. He's kind of he hasn't put together a race run since Tokyo 2021 when he finally did a, a race competition. So this weekend is him coming back, reasserting his dominance over the U.S. men's field and ensuring that he can win himself a spot because he wants to represent his home country of the USA at uh, the 2028 Olympics in Los Angeles. And what you see me how is he is just powerful, but he is skillful. He uses the water so effectively, and he is just cruising down. You can see every single stroke he's pulling. Looks sedate. It is not. Mihao is a powerhouse and some of his results on the world circuit back in the day when he was racing and training full time are absolutely top flight. Many finals, many medals in World Cups um, and does get a little hung up, a little too close unfortunately there. You see maybe a little forearm fatigue cutting in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he's come out of retirement so he's not been training as hard as he used to but I know that's about to change. He... Uh, had the opportunity to chat with him a little bit last night after the event, and you can see that the fire is back inside him. He managed to light it like the fires of Mordor, and he is coming back for a vengeance. So, we've got Wyatt on, on track. So we go, now, the reason that Mihao went first, these are in reverse rank. Mihao's been out of the sport for three years, really, hasn't had a result, so his ranking is basically rock bottom right now even though he's still a phenomenal paddler so now we come back to some of the other paddlers that don't have as much experience younger junior paddlers as Wyatt really does an excellent job through that middle section that was great really nice has to struggle a little bit for 13 but gets back on track works his way away from the rocks over the river right nice little backstroke as he readjusts through 14 surfs the little feature between those two waves 
And he's keeping a nice even stroke rate. The balance that this young man has, very effective. Beautiful little sweep up. He knows where he's, he is, aware of where the gate. Nice sweep. Oh, gets stalled. Doesn't quite get the jump he needed. But he is really doing well through this middle section. Unfortunately, pushed a little far right. Has to get his shoulder out of the way, but doesn't quite do it on 18. Stalled out in the hole, but these young paddlers looking for their um, junior team spot. And it'll be interesting to see. I'll go back to the results. See what we're up to as Bryson Long of the Long family out of Cascade, Idaho. Just gets, unfortunately, a little messy at the top of the course. Does a really nice upstream sweep. Gets his stern buried. Unfortunately, while it looks cool, it is not fast. Um, you'll get freestyle paddlers that will throw their boats around in all sorts of directions and for the uh, joy of just doing tricks. But this racing, you want to keep that bow relatively low and the boat moving forward. As uh, Bryson doesn't quite get the hit from the, the feature. It almost like flushes out him. You can see just a little pulse in that feature between 11 and 12. And Bryson getting it back together, getting pushed a little far over to the rocks. Has to do a bigger zig than he would have wanted to. And zags back across the feature. Quick head dink through 15. That was a really nice little move. i got to give him credit. And he's recomposed himself from that errors of the top section. Drives out across. The Long family again out of Idaho just have massive volume rivers to paddle. And so it uh, must be something in the water or something just working at his dad's rafting company or on his granddad's horse farm that these, uh, these boys know how to work. They are powerful. His dad's a very accomplished multi-martial or mixed martial arts fighter. And, uh, but also a very nice human being. So uh, he's a bit of a beefcake, though. And definitely don't want to tussle with him. Lovely guy. And we're back up to the top with Josh Gavert, one of our Canadian contingent. He's a uh, young Canadian junior. has been putting in a tremendous amount of effort here, working with their coaches as they develop and go to some of the junior competitions throughout the season. And they're not a part of the U.S. team trials as far as the ranking goes but they are using this opportunity for a, a world-class race in North America that they can go to, gain some experience, and get some beautiful warm water paddling out here. At a time of the year that Canada's really just emerging from the long, dark winter and freeze, the, uh, they can come down to Montgomery, Alabama and enjoy some just glorious 80-degree weather that we've been treated to. It's just a nice light breeze and... It has been a phenomenal weekend of racing uh, for us to check out in Montgomery. Josh is putting together an excellent run here. Driving out across the wave at gate 16. And hopefully he finishes his race off very well. As you can see from the orange boat, we've got another one of the longs coming down. This is Isaac. Always paddle their orange Vida boats. And these slalom boats kind of become a little bit of a characteristic so you can definitely tell who's who by their color design and you'll see the athletes kind of using a, a single design throughout their career and sticking with that becomes their trademark. It's uh, the famous Slovakian uh, Michael Martigan always paddling a hot red boat and for example Peter Kauser from Slovenia just a, a yellow fade on a black background and Hopefully these athletes are trying to make a mark for themselves and become as legendary as that, that you'll, you'll see them with their trademark boats. So the longs opting for the orange. As a ginger, I appreciate that. And uh, Isaac is just putting it back together through this middle section. Looks like the judges have maybe given him a 50 up on gate three. Unfortunately, judged to have missed that gate. Didn't quite get his head through. And... Uh, but he's doing a very good job of getting through this middle section. It's interesting to see how he how he does. He's a small paddler. He's getting 
the option of being pushed around a little bit. But at the same time, he's not intimidated. The longs, as I mentioned earlier, when his um, cousin was going through, that they are just powerful paddlers. They know how to use big white water. They're used to paddling on the, the payette. And uh, while the Montgomery Whitewater course is a, a powerful channel, it doesn't compare to a volume of natural river that you get in those rocky mountains up in the Idaho. And uh, he's still doing well. He's still on, getting a little unstuck on some of this bottom section. I think you can see the fatigue just getting to him. His head's back. He's breathing hard. So hopefully Isaac can finish strong, get back on course, and, and learn what he needs to from this this uh, this race here in Montgomery, Alabama. He's got a hole right there again. That experience paddling that enormous water out in Idaho, really doing a good job for him. And he is just moving his way through this course very nicely. So, oh, unfortunately, gets back into the hole at 18. That is not the way you want to do that. But he surfs out very well. He's just, you can see he's exhausted. It is, uh, it's not just a matter of the race day, it's all the preparation, the travel, the hours spent, the stress, and it is unbelievable to see these young paddlers out here, just giving it their all. Much like Riker Harris from Canada, a very animated paddler, brilliant little, oh, brilliant little move through gate four, goes in tight, has to throw his head a little bit, but that looked gorgeous, and I think we're going to see a nice, fast time. He came at came unstuck on the oh nice speak catches his stern wax gate six loses the wave but he's back on he's got to put that behind himself now focus on what's coming downstream not what he would have liked to but again for these junior athletes it is all about gaining experience we are looking for them to develop as they grow get more mature understand where they can take risks where they can't take risks in the race and that's all about just getting time in a boat understanding how you react to that stress and uh, and then applying it to future races. I uh, know their coaches are going to be taking a lot away from this week. They've spent the last couple of weeks down here in Montgomery on their way down from Ottawa. And he smoothed that middle move. He gained his composure. It's interesting to see these young paddlers. A lot of the time, it's kind of that they sort of have moments of brilliance. And it's not necessarily their in their wheelhouse to put a full run together uh, and that's the maturity that's that experience but Riker really has done a great job recomposing himself jumps over the hole in 17 that's what I mean by moments of brilliance that was a great little move and you can see that he really has the skills he just needs to make it more consistent and he will be a phenomenal paddler in the future and hopefully a force to be reckoned with up on that Canadian team I know their coaches work so hard and uh, it really is nice to see them down here. And uh, Michael and James will be very proud of Riker and what he just put down. And hopefully his parents, if they're watching up in Canada, are going to be proud of him too because that was a great run. we got Diddy from D.C. And he's been putting down some great runs. He's paddling in K1 and C1. So he's got a huge workload here this week. He's coming down with the Whitewater Racing Club from D.C., the lineage of paddlers that's come out of there. And uh, I think it would be a miss for me to not mention some of the phenomenal coaches that they've had in their time. They've got Sylvan Poberai, former U.S. coach. They've got Tyler Westerfall, who doubles up as an athlete and a coach. And, of course, the legendary Donna Kladek, who was a coach for that club for such a long time, had such a huge impact on the sport. And uh, I hope that she is watching these young athletes and enjoying the foundations that they laid in those formative days of the Potomac Whitewater Racing Club. So uh, just, again, it's, it's, always a, it's always a village, and it takes years to develop the experience, not just to race, but also to understand how to give feedback, how to develop a program. And uh, one of the things that we see here, Ricky Powell crushing gate four. I get excited because I do love this guy. He is a wonderful human being and just a dynamite in a boat. So skillful. Taking some time out of competition while he goes to focus on his career in computer securities and cyber security. Uh, and uh, recently moved to Charleston, South Carolina with his wife, Kat. 
Uh, and they've uh, made a wonderful life for themselves in the in the Carolinas. And Ricky is just putting on a masterclass. He obviously not trained as much. I think some of his cardio and pure strength. But what you can see from this run is that he just has skills. Uh, you know, Ricky. Ricky's kind of that silent assassin when it comes to paddling. He's pretty reserved. But you can always see that glint in his eye that he means business. Throws his head back there as he understands that he's made a mistake. Irritating him, but he is throwing down. He's not lost a beat. He went to the Olympics in 20 in 2008 with Casey Eichfeld in C2. So he has the experience at a very high level of competition. Went there when he was like 18 years old, so a very young man. And now he's beautiful little move over to 19. Takes a quick tap off the wall. Nice sweep up, up to 20. I think Ricky is going to be incredibly proud of this. And uh, it's always nice to see these athletes develop, not just as paddlers, but just human beings over the years that you get to know them from young juniors competing in the sport all the way to establish themselves through as, as seniors and even into their professional lives and outside of uh, a slalom. All right, we've got Bib 55, Avila Hepner, another one of our guys from Colorado these juniors from Colorado they've obviously got something in the water out there and uh, they are producing a great crop of juniors that are gaining experience on this sort of whitewater they don't get to come east of the Mississippi too much and for them to paddle a slalom course like Montgomery is a huge benefit unfortunately Oliver getting a little unstuck there kind of losing his balance going into gate 12 it's, it's important to understand just how unstable these boats are. They're so maneuverable, but just the average paddler jumping in a slalom boat as he backs out of the hole. That was a cool little demonstration of how to uh, adapt in the, the moment as, as he just understands that spinning the boat around then wasn't what he needed to do. He just back it out and uh, on his way. But the balance of these boats, the instability, in order to be so maneuverable and so dynamic, your primary stability is almost nothing. So to be able to paddle a boat like this in white water, the core strength, the body awareness, and uh, just the skills that they really require is uh, next level. Uh, Ethan Van Horn, one of our senior paddlers that's been on the circuit for a long time, getting a little too close to gate five, but going direct on gate six, looking like he's understands what he has to do very tight on gate seven and unfortunately couldn't quite get his hand under so he does probably take a touch there we'll see what the judges have to say i'm incredibly impressed he's just going for it looks like he's using a lefty paddle looks kind of different to the usual offset and he's left-handed so very nice to see him paddling down great skip at 11 He'll be happy with that. Doesn't quite get the penetration into the eddy that he was looking for. And does sort of side slip across. Um, let's follow him over. Oh, he's in the hole. Controls it well. Doesn't flip over. Looks like he's got a slight smile as he knows that he got away with something there. That was very close to going for a rodeo ride in that center hole. And he is back in composure. Really, really good boat control just to see how Ethan manages to back out of that. And uh, ooh, doesn't quite get the drive he needed across to gate 7. So now, as 17, as you see, now he's struggling to get under. But um, he'll, be, uh, he'll be happy with parts of this run. He'll be looking to kind of learn from that, understand where he can piece it all back together uh, to lay down some more runs in Oklahoma in a couple of weeks. And Ethan doing a good job of just getting it back together, finishing off the course like he means business. Lovely to see as he finishes up the course. Now you see Ethan just go over the final drop here at the Montgomery Whitewater course. It's really fun to paddle. It's, it's actually a very long competition choice. You course you've got multiple sections the top zoom flume section into a middle sedate excellent to uh, kind of take a breather at the middle amphitheater section before you go under the bridge and you've got two large drops that are 
really exciting to paddle down below where the course finishes. Now, typically these paddlers will compete on a course that's somewhere between a 250 to 300 meters long and uh, meters for the people that like using freedom units are what we use in Europe. Uh, they're just slightly longer than your average yard and we are going back to the top of the course with Eric Stutt, oh sorry Nick just double check the bib number yeah we do have Nick we missed one of our competitors that's why there was a slight pause and uh, we've got he does a great job of 14. A little scrappy on the paddle strokes, but you can see that he means business. And that was a great little duck. Raw, Just pushing the boat around. He had to work hard for that. You see the core strength that these paddlers are developing brilliantly out through 6 and 7. And Nick is just... He's styling this one. No issues whatsoever. Really fantastic to see a paddler like that put down a... Uh, a solid top section of the run. You can take a little bit of time. Does get stalled out in that eddy as again he works to bring the bow back. And this boulder contingent of paddlers just really giving it their all. You can see that they they mean business when it comes to racing. And he is not slowing down. Drives out through that chunky little hole at 13. Big sweep, massive sweep through 14. And uh, this is an example of how you can see how much these guys are working. These top paddlers, you'll often feel like they're just not doing much. But Nick is putting on a display of just how much work this slalom really takes. And uh, he'll be looking as he develops through the junior ranks as uh, to smooth that up. But I really don't want you to get rid of that passionate style. You were commitment all the way. And... Uh, we really, really want to see Nick carry on with that level of just getting stuck here. We've got Evan Werner back here at the top. He just styled gate four, slid in there like it was nothing. Does a quick pivot on gate six. Oh, flips over. That was unfortunate for him. Just lost his composure there for a second. Thought he put his paddle in, thought there was going to be support. And that's what I mean by the balance challenge that these athletes have is he really thought that there was going to be support from his paddle. And if it misses it there, you've got no recourse. The secondary stability of these boats is not there. The primaries are really not there either. So keeping that body weight and that center of gravity directly above the seat almost at all times is where these guys spend a tremendous amount of time training and honing those skills, both on the water and in the gym. And uh, some of the more elaborate training methods that we've seen being used, sort of balancing on... Swiss balls and yoga balls doing all sorts of unique balance and offset oblique work. It's, it's kind of uh, every once in a while looks a little bit like circus training, but they uh, they assure me that it does wonders. And uh, I can imagine because they're paddling significantly better than I ever did that it does work wonders. And unfortunately, another slight bobble from Evan. It's uh, a nice little ear dip see some freestyle paddlers and creakers doing ear dips off waterfalls but uh, not fast in a slalom race unfortunately so Evan will be looking to clean up when they get to Oklahoma. Connor Harkinson Connor's been impressing me all weekend uh, just a, a small paddler lots of power lots of passion and y you can see again these Colorado kids who Actually, I apologize, I don't know who their coach is, but whoever it is should be very proud because the passion that they bring is impressive, and I, I love to see it. Um, I'll have to chase somebody down and, and find out a little bit more about their program later on because Connor, Riker, and oh, sorry, some of those guys are, are doing well. I apologize, Riker's a Canadian. But Connor, styling out through gate 13, takes a wonderful little stroke off that powerful shoulder, driving down through 14 catches a beautiful little surf hung up slightly but you can see how much effort and passion he's putting in good body position he's not rocking too much gets a little off balance again you can see just thought there was going to be more support there and there wasn't 
drives out beautifully through 17, takes the sweep stroke, does it direct, just keeps going. A little further out there than you want to. You can save some time by cutting a little bit close, but he made that work, and that is not to be sniffed at. So these young competitors just gaining experience, racing on a high level, and uh, doing fantastically. So it's Finnegan's Blackburn from Colorado, just getting hung up on the entry to four. Um, comes down. I'm going to take a quick break and give you the update. I've just been handed the official signed ultra official uh, results from the K1 women this this afternoon. And after the two runs this afternoon, we definitively have Evie Liebfast just laying it down, doing exactly what she knew she could do, overtaking Luca Jones into first place. We've got Rhea Sribar again improving massively. She was able to cut several seconds off her time. She slots into second. So currently, Evie Liebfarth has quite the margin with 3.2 and 3 seconds in the good. And Luca Jones back there in third, not quite getting back on top. Again, she's out here for experience, but as a silver medalist in Rio, that really does indicate to Evie that she's paddling very well, that she's almost four seconds ahead of Luca in third. Fourth place, we've got Marcella Altman. Um, Earlier on, we got to watch her paddle down. She put on a beautiful, beautiful run for 114 seconds and clean on her first run. Lois Betteridge in fifth. Carden Otting, the young paddler from Narahela Gorge, in sixth. Isabella Altman, the other Altman uh, sibling, in seventh. Ashley Nee, former uh, U.S. team member, and uh, not quite getting out to where she wants to be. She's got lots of work to do if she's going to get back on that U.S. team. And we have Lucy Crino in 9th, another young paddler. Ruby Krosek in 10th. Ivy Lentz in 11th. Olivia Spencer in 12th. And Emily LaRiche uh, putting down a, a, a second run. She didn't start in the first run, but she did get back out there for the second runs. She rounds us out in 13th place. But I'm going to go back to Finnegan. Sounds like he's had some fun times in that middle section, putting down some good runs as we go back to the top of the course with Edward James Werner. These, these paddlers doing a, a great job. As Edward navigates his way through the amphitheater section. Judge just deemed him clean on that gate. And you can see them waving their arms, giving the signals, and then they've also got scribes out there, volunteers from the local community, also sitting here in the commentary booth. We've got a local volunteer helping us run the broadcast, and uh, it's great to see so much passion and commitment from the locals getting out here, helping put on an event that just wouldn't happen without our volunteers, be them judges or uh, scribes, runners, broadcast help. We've got camera people out here. Uh, the people working in the kitchen to help feed the athletes and the entire team here at Montgomery Whitewater as Edward just gets a little unstuck down there at the bottom, having some issues, and will rejoin Drac Trehan up at the top of the course as he styles his way through gate four. Being a little tentative coming out, though. I'd like to see maybe just a little bit more drive. Maybe he's making sure that he's hitting the gates, but just... Let's see, uh, let's see the passion that we know he's capable of. And uh, Jack, another one of our U.S. juniors, looking for their first spots on the U.S. junior team. That'll give them the option of going to Europe and getting coached by U.S. athletes. Um, it's just a, a wonderful thing to see when they can get the support they need. A lot of the time, the jump from these local coaches, uh, they are, you know, working full-time jobs it's not their full-time job to coach so they're doing it in their free time and, and helping people as they go so as the kids can get into those junior ranks on the u.s roster then it will give them access to full-time coaching and full-time coaching at events that they just otherwise wouldn't have and, uh, and it also gets them onto the water with some of the higher level paddlers and that experience and exposure to the skills that they're going to need in the future on those senior ranks Fortunately, getting a little hung up at 15. Has to do a little spin. Jack's not quite go back to um, Ethan Watt up here at the top of the course. 
going for a very wide approach, plows himself into the wall. That, while unique, is not fast. Um, so not necessarily where he wants to be, and he's struggling right near this. Section of the Zoom Flume, uh, Ethan is a very good paddler, but unfortunately just getting unstuck. And that's a, a wonderful example of just how challenging Whitewater can be when uh, things go a little pear-shaped. So um, he's backing off. I hope he can use this moment to regain his composure after an event like that it can get the adrenaline spiked. And while people may think that athletes like this are adrenaline junkies, they really aren't. They're actually very serious athletes, and adrenaline is the worst thing that you can have to be coursing through your veins while you're trying to put down a race ride. It makes you jittery. And uh, while it helps in fight and flight situations, it's not necessarily what you need when you're trying to be controlled and measured. And uh, Ethan, unfortunately, the wheels have fallen off a little bit on the top. Let's see if he can bolt them back on for the bottom section of the course. See how he does through 11. Uh, doesn't quite get the bounce that he wants there. So he's, he's, he's probably going to have to just chalk this one up to experience and uh, come back in Oklahoma in two weeks' time. Let's see if he can get out into the hole at 13. Ops for a unique option going for the spin. Doesn't quite get the bow turned down, so has to back off around that. And, uh, yeah, right now we just want to make sure that he gets to the bottom of the run nice and cleanly as we uh, join Tiger Ballrath, another one of our ever-present mainstays on the Olympic scene or the U.S. scene. Tiger is super passionate. Doesn't get to paddle as much on whitewater as he would love being down in Florida, but he's at every single event. Always chipper, always excited to race. And uh, Tiger has been super supportive of the community. And it's great to see him out here. I often see him walking around on, on deck with his pet chihuahua and his daughters. And uh, Tiger making sweet work of gate 12. Had a bit of a mare on run one, and it looks like he's doing a great job. Buries the bow into the pit of the hole, but doesn't slow him up too bad. And he's definitely improving from what he did this morning. He had some slight unforced errors. And I'm pretty sure that Tiger's going to be happy with what he's laying down right now. So he's working his way through to gate 16. These final couple of moves doesn't control his bow into the eddy well enough and does get a slight touch. But as again, it's not me judging, so we'll let them up. But when you leave a gate like that swinging, it's probably pretty definitive. So sweeps down. Looks like Ethan wasn't doing what he needed to, so pulled out of the way. And Tiger is now navigating the stopper feature between 18 and 19 and having some troubles. Nothing too crazy. And you can tell how hard he's working. He looks gassed, and, but he's not going to quit. I can tell you, Tiger is nothing. He is never a quitter. I've seen him just constantly go, and he will put 100% effort in all the way down. And he is going for it, sprinting down to the final as he's overtaken Ethan Watt, who is also not quitting, doing a great job. Just that grit and determination. Finds his way into the hole at 18. Braces on the upstream side. Can be a little dodgy for your shoulders at times, so be careful. But uh, he's still gunning for it. That's great to see. You know, he's he's not had the run he wants. He's had a lot of a lot of issues, but he is still going, and that is grit and determination that we want to see. Back up to the top of the course, we've got Simon Battle out of Canada. This young 23-year-old, or under 23, I should say, is. Uh, been putting down some good runs. Nice little duck. Managing his bow angle very well through six. Really quick, aggressive sweep as he catches. Can't quite control his bow through seven. Does take that. And you see, once he's hit the gate, he doesn't really care at that point. He can smack it if he needs to because only one touch on a gate counts. So he didn't really have to worry about his exit too much. He could just make sure that he navigated the gate and concentrate on what's downstream. So... Into the amphitheater section. Doesn't quite get the bounce he needs on, on 11. But Simon doing an excellent job 
of just managing that slight error. Oh, make sure your angle's good. You're going out a little too deep, and he's going to have to work hard to get over to 13. Now, talk about angles. These paddlers coming out of these eddies into the main flow really have to be conscious of where their boat is pointing and what their sort of vectors are going to be in order to make the next gate. And there, it's if you've ever done math in middle school or or high school and little Jimmy jumps into the river going at X meters a second and he's swimming at Y perpendicular to flow, where does he end up? Well, you're sat there with a calculator doing trigonometry. These guys are doing that in real time. And they're judging every single flow, every single force of nature and reacting to it with split seconds. As Bennett George, another developing paddler out of Tennessee, deals with that slight mishap on the eddy line very well. In the uninitiated eye, you wouldn't even notice it, but he had a slight bubble coming out of four, and he is back on track. Bennett met him a few years ago in Charlotte, North Carolina, as he was developing into the sport and his dad supporting him. And it is great to see them still just putting in a tremendous amount of effort, working on his skills. Clean so far, came very close to gate five when he was doing that. Unfortunately, picks up a touch on 11. But Bennett, not just shaking that off, gets a great angle out of 12, drives over into the pit of the hole, takes the shoulder excellently as it just swings him around. Beautiful little pivot through this offset at 14-15. And Bennett should be very, very proud of how he's been paddling this weekend. So, always wonderful. Not seen some of these paddlers paddle in maybe a year or two. And it's great to see them, the, the jumps and forward progression that they and their coaches have made. And I, it's just, I can't wait to see the progression over the next four years as they develop. You know, some of them will be seniors by that point, will be competing for those Olympic berths. And uh, Lachlan just getting caught up, got a little greedy on the entrance. He thought he could handle it, but unfortunately has to pivot around, gets pushed up above the gate. And he is going to reassess, clear that from his mind. Now Lockie out here from Canada, real beautiful. Watch his stern there, it's not as deep as you think. Catches his knee at the, the boat on the gate at 7. And just getting a little scrappy. This is, uh, I think his coach is going to go. It's like, calm it down just a touch, Lachlan. But he is a very powerful paddler. You can tell he's got skills. He's trying to uh, cut out all the margins. But unfortunately, he's uh, cascading of errors and... Maybe just a touch of frustration is creeping into the paddling at this point in the run. Hope he can just take something positive away from this run and uh, reassess. Now again, for these Canadians, this is race practice. They do not have to worry about any selection at this race. So they are just racing for glory, racing for experience, and uh, ensuring that they are honing their skills before they travel over to Europe and start competing on the world stage over in Paris and through the World Cups and in the World Championships. That was brilliant. Really nice move there from ben, uh, from Lachlan. You can see the skills that he has. While it's not been the best run, and he'll be frustrated with it, moments of brilliance where you just go, yes, that boy knows how to paddle. Tyler Gavert, another one of our Canadian contingent down here with a Stancheski and Cartwright. And what we love to see... Bashes the pole on the inside at five with his nose. Not necessarily what you want to be, but that's kind of the, the name of the game. You know, you can get wild. It, it will feel good, but it's not fast. And, and it will cost you errors. So you'll, you'll see these coaches, such eager, young, talented athletes that you know 90% of the time the coaches are just trying to calm them down and make sure that they use their brains and, and paddle sensibly. Um, but Tyler driving in beautifully into 12. Grease is that move. Let's hope he can get a nice exit out on 13. Looks like he's got some power. Understands how to engage the water. Absolutely hammers that move. So even after his top mistakes, he's focused. Quick paddle dip under 14. This is what we love to see. Love to see a paddler just reassess and pull it back together to ensure that he's using the run appropriately gaining that experience so 
while some of the top end guys can't make mistakes or can't make many, it's how you deal with them. It's how you understand how your brain works, what your mentality is in that face of diversity, and ensuring that you can refocus and just get that get that brain re-engaged at a high level. That John Coleman just greasing gate four. That was glorious. Kind of another one of these paddlers that we're seeing just rip out here. He is smooth. He's kind of got that nice lanky style. Gives him a lot of leverage. A lot of the time you'll see the guys with longer arms. Slightly slower stroke rates. But just as much power. Lots of leverage. Beautiful little shoulder dip going through 10. And an absolutely stylish. He's just hanging on that left stroke. That left draw as he rolls out to 13. Man, John Coleman should be proud of this. He is not hanging about. Absolutely wonderful to see this sort of paddling from this young gentleman. And he's going for a, one of the under 23 spots on the US team. Beautiful little sweep up on 16. Let's hold it together for the bottom of the run. Super proud. He should be so happy with this run. And he's got a couple hard little moves to make. Jumps into the hole, gets his weight forward. You can see what he's doing there is stopping the boat from spinning out. And that was very good, very measured paddling. And we're about to see a good time from John. Uh, I'm really excited to see what he ends up with. But that was some excellent paddling as we join Isaac Zimmerman at the top of the course. And Isaac will be looking to really capitalize on the time here, the experience. Let's see what he's up to so far. Looks like he's putting together a pretty good run. Um, this is one of our Canadians that's down here. Just getting some experience, understanding where he is. Looks like uh, John Coleman just slotted himself into third place. So he really did have a spectacular run. So while it looked nice and smooth and measured, it was fast. So he's actually jumped into third place ahead of Kalen, ahead of Tyler Westfall. Um, yeah, John Coleman just crushing it. And Isaac Zimmerman from Canada coming down here, training with uh, their national team coaches, putting in a tremendous amount of effort. I know they're really enjoying the air show last weekend. The Blue Angels were doing flybys as they were training last Saturday and Sunday. And they, uh, you know, nothing like a little bit of... U.S. Navy just putting on a show for these wonderful athletes. Merle Long driving into gate four. The power of these Long family. They are so, so energetic. It's that, that's, that's farm strong. That's horse farm strong. You know, you don't, you don't get that by working out in a gym you get that working out in the field and these guys are just beasts the long family just a dynasty of paddlers out there in Idaho and he is ripping through this top section of the course I don't think I've seen him that energized all weekend it must be something about the last run beautiful upstream sweep through great 12 drives back in only two strokes quick takes a very aggressive approach to 13 that was high risk high reward very quick duck through 15 has to drop a shoulder through for 15 but he is ripping it through this section absolutely one to see now, interestingly enough something that I wasn't aware of before this weekend that the longs and have uh, an option to compete for the Australian team so they're no longer competing under the American designation they're actually competing for the Australian Federation and that is giving them uh, some options there ducks in under 22 I've got to give him that was a brilliant brilliant run from Merle had an opportunity to paddle with him and his father on one of my local rivers in North Carolina the Wataga yeah, a very very healthy level and when he was a few years younger and uh, even back then that boy was talented he just 
very composed and uh, the pleasure to pleasure to paddle with the Merles. Got Mark from Canada on on course. Now these Canadians, a wealth of knowledge. They've still had a changing of the guard over the last few years. Their previous K1 man um, have uh, retired out of the sport. They've, got, they've had some great ones with John Hastings, David Ford, Ben Hayward. Uh, it was always a pleasure to see John Hastings out there racing. Not always the best role in the world. Had some issues with that. But that tall gentleman was absolute scholar. And it uh, looks like Mark is doing a great job taking over the dynasty from those elder statesmen of Canadian paddling. Mark just has to readjust there, has keeps his edge up, drives into 17. Some skills, checks up unfortunately too close. Has a kind of un uncharacteristic error going into 18. Gets very aggressive on 19. We'll see what the judges give him on that. That looked dodgy, but again, my angle is only one angle, and this particular angle from the camera is not going to be good for that gate. So we'll see what the judges have to say. Another one of the longs, Kyle Long, ripping in through gate 4. Seems like they've had uh, definitely had their Wheaties over uh, over lunch, and this phenomenal group of paddling is uh, seems like they're doing a very good job out there in Idaho. They're coached by both their fathers and their granddad. It's a whole paddling dynasty out in Cascade, Idaho, and. Uh, just going to give a quick shout out to Idaho because it's a phenomenal state. If you've never been, beautiful. Nice. Really good there from Kaika. Nice little lean back limbo move. Doesn't even have to move his body through 15. He is ripping through. Lovely to see. And actually outside the commentary tent, I can hear his family just cheering for him. Has to spin, doesn't quite get the skip that he wanted. It's not going to cost him a ton of time, maybe you know half a second here. But he checks himself up through 18, takes a loss of the hole. Probably want to be a little further under the back of that feature, but he he knew what he was doing. Just dropped in, muscled his way out of it, and you can see that as a powerful young man. Sweep up on 22. Oh, maybe a little too close. We'll see what the judges say. As we get to the sharp end, Jormund Sherman hailing from D.C. Oh, just clattering gate four. Ah, that's a bad way to start the run, unfortunately. But put that behind you, Jordan. He had a phenomenal day yesterday. And Jordan's one of these dark horses. He's been on the circuit for a long time. Had a sort of resurgence, a jump forward a couple of years ago. And just taking that next step. He was always on the cusp of getting onto the U.S. team. But now he's in the process of cementing his himself on that on that three birth team it's basically him me how jordan kalen and tyler westfall that are all competing for those stops again having some issues down at number 12 but he had a good day yesterday they've got four days of racing that are counting towards u.s trials this year for the the Olymp for the the u.s team now unfortunately these gentlemen were not able to qualify a k1 spot for men so they're not going to the olympics this year a uh, bit of a disappointment and one of the motivating factors for me how to try and come out of retirement and kind of show the young generation how it's done. But Jordan just putting putting apart some of those mistakes up top, doing a very good job on this bottom section, hung up on the entry to 19, doesn't get the drive across that he needed, punts off the wall, back over into the final offset. You are just beat at this point in the weekend. His fourth run. Kalen Friedenson. Can't say enough nice things about this young gentleman. Phenomenal paddler. Very talented. That was a beautiful little awareness. Had to just pause ever so slightly on the, the stroke to get through four. Gets wide on gate five. Has to spin six. Not what he was going for. Takes him a little longer than he needed to to get onto. Unfortunately, Kalen had a bit of a blowout yesterday. Not where he wanted to be. So he is on the back foot to get that Olymp or that U.S. team spot. You see Roffle trotting down on the distance, his coach. Kalen, however, still hot on the heels of his victory at the Green Race, the Green River Narrows Race in Saluda, North Carolina, last year. 
crushing the competition, beating Dane Jackson to victory, dethroning the crown. And Kalen, just a phenomenal paddler. And, oh, that was glorious. Just skirts over the back of that hole. Just taking a, a nice little dip through the offset at 14-15. Uh, recomposing himself for these final two hard moves. You've got this cross-skip dive move at 16-17. Beautiful through there. That was stylish as always. And we're going to see him. Final little move. Gets a little uncertain, but doesn't seem to hold him up. He doesn't drop low out there. Controls himself well, so even with that ever so slight bobble, looks like he's got a good time. And we are back up to the top with Tyler Westfall, another one of our paddlers, phenomenally talented. Again, Tyler, really, really wonderful human being, tons of passion, spends most of his time coaching the young athletes at the Potomac Whitewater Racing Club, all while training full time to try and get himself, gets very close to gate number seven. Very, very close. We'll see whether they brush him on that one. Um, but Tyler is ripping through. So we still have Michael Smolin in first at this time. We'll see where Kalen ended up. Oh, beautiful skip. Real good sweep. You can see the determination. He knows that this run counts. You know, Tyler unfortunately had a blowout yesterday, made some uncharacteristic errors. He probably just got a little too aggressive. So he knows that this run counts. Again, it's both days count nothing doesn't and so he's got to make sure that he has a very good run and he is on his way to a very fast run here his first run he had a little bit of a, an error at the bottom section of the course so let's hope he can keep it together he skips into the hole flurry of strokes to get him out brilliant little sweep up drive out you can see him hang on a stroke that's them using the water they can feel the currents under with the blade of their paddle this is where he had that slight error on run one takes it very safe that was sensible paddling from tyler and i commend him for doing so hopefully that was a solid run joshua joseph absolutely nailing gate four that was greasy unfortunately follows it up with a rather dodgy approach to gate five but hopefully that second penalty won't hurt him too much as he ducks in ducks out of gate seven and you can see josh Different style, very aggressive, very dynamic. And again, Raffle in the background, running down, cheering on his athletes, seeing where he's going wrong. Josh knows that he can't lay up. He, he's got overtaken by Mihao on run two, drives into the hole at gate 13, and he is off and racing. He's got this one... Last opportunity this weekend to see whether he can put himself back on top for the U.S. team and ensure that he is well placed going into the final team trials in Oklahoma City. That was a glorious sweep up. Quick duck out. Nice sweep. No issues there. Brilliant body awareness to bring his paddle out. He knew that he was going to hit it, so he had to bring his paddle up high. And oh, very close on the inside pole at 19. He has to just use his body English. To get out of the way that's awareness is he gonna go for the sweep up this is dangerous oh beautiful little pivot as you saw earlier Tyler went conservative Josh did not let's see what that does he is struggling down there to the end get strokes in gives himself a little shake of the head but I, I, I don't know I think he should be happy with that run we'll see whether he can dethrone Michael Smolin into first place and right now just waiting for those those results so that brings our, our k1 men to a conclusion we're gonna sort of be waiting here for a little bit while we wait for our c1 men and if these very unofficial results serve me correctly that is nine hundredths of a second that split michael smolin from Joshua Joseph. Now, as a, a quick amendment to that, Josh's raw time was faster than Mihao Smolin, but because he picked up that penalty on gate five, then he is currently nine hundredths of a second behind Michael Smolin. That is an incredibly fine margin. Tyler Westerfall looks like he did pick up some good time in, the, in uh, third place. John Coleman 
putting down a ripper of a run for fourth place. Very impressed. And looks like Merle Long had an absolute heater, puts himself into fifth. And uh, just some excellent results. Really, really good. So let's run through. Again, these are the unofficial results. We'll get the official results as signed off by the chief judge here in a little bit. So unofficial as I talk about them. We're going to sit here with Mihal Smolin in first. We've got Joshua Josephs. I'll remind you, just nine hundredths of a second behind. Tyler Westerfall, he had a clean run. He's uh, nine tenths of a second behind Mihal. Uh, John Coleman, uh, Christy Williams in fourth. Absolutely stunning, stunning performance. Uh, from that young young American. Uh, Merle Long representing Australia in fifth. Kalen Friedenson not having the run he's going to be happy with. I think he's got a little bit of soul searching to do after this weekend. He's going to reassess, get back on track, understand what he's got to do going into Oklahoma. And those, those positions will be up to play. So it looks like Mihau is solidifying his place at the top of the leaderboard. Joshua Joseph doing a very good job of putting himself there. And now we've got Tyler Westfall, Kalen Friedenson, and Gordon Sherman all fighting for those spots. So below Kalen, we've got uh, Kyle... Kyle Long just doing that in seventh place. Jordan Sherman... Raw time, not terrible, um, but unfortunately he did get six penalty or six additional seconds of penalties, so he's sitting down there in eighth right now. He's going to have a lot of work to do to get back on that team going into Oklahoma. Uh, Mark Zalonka from Canada, a really good performance. A little bit off the time, he's nine seconds back. Ricky Powell, um, that retirement, he just needs to put in maybe a touch of training, and he's down there in tenth. Uh, he's going to have some work to do. Isaac Zimmerman from Canada in 11th. Taylor Gavert from Canada in 12th. Bennett George, the young Tennessean, absolutely crushing it in 13th. He had a very good run. I'm super proud of that young gentleman. And uh, we've got William over there in 14th. Evan Werner of USA in 15th. Uh, Nick in 16th. Simon Battle of Canada in 17th. Um, Lachlan Faraday from Canada, 18th, um, and Bennett Long in from the USA in 19th, and Josh Gavert of Canada in 20th. Um, doesn't seem to be missing a beat. Um, we are back on course with the K C1 women for their final run of the weekend. And we've got Carden Otting from the uh, Natahela Gorge doing a phenomenal job out here on course. And Carden's a, a young up-and-comer. It looks like she's got some great skills. She's working on her foundations. Probably not used to paddling this scale of whitewater as often. The Natahela Gorge is a, a little smaller volume, not quite as pushy. But it's a phenomenal place to work on your skills. They spend a, a tremendous amount of time there by the bridge, working on the bridge gates. Just back and forth, back and forth, getting exceptional feedback from the coaches up at the Natahela Racing Club. Um... And also, as it's the home base of Evie Liebfarth, she has such the role model and training partner to work with. And uh, does a l really nice little head duck through 17. Nice to see. Got Emily LaRiche from Charlotte working on her C1 skills here. Um, having a little bit of trouble there with gate 5 and opts to avoid gate 7 entirely. So it looks like she's out here. It's always interesting to see some of these competitors that are, you know, they're still developing. They're still working on their skills. And uh, these are intimidating events to come to. You know, they're competing against the, the best in the country. And in the case of uh, events like this, you've got Luca Jones and Evie Liebfarth and Rhea, world-class competitors. And, you know, you're lining up against them. It's, it's intimidating. The crowd, the commentators, and... Uh, it's just a good opportunity for them to practice their skills, understand what it means to be stressed at a race. And I can assure you those butterflies, even after years of competition, don't really go away. So it's just a matter of how you control them and uh, keep them as quiet as you can. But Emily, working her way through gate 12, she's going to drive back out into the current for gate 13. Doesn't quite get out there enough certain degree of apprehension. It's uh, 
She'll learn to attack the water as she gets more comfortable in her skills. And and a lot of time you'll see these athletes kind of they'll they'll plateau for a little bit as they they work on skills, and then you'll see them just all of a sudden the light switch will flick, they jump up, and they'll just get this meteoric rise in skill as, as something, whatever it was, clicked. Whether it's something the coach has said, whether it's another year of maturity. And uh, that's what we're seeing from Isabella Altman right here. One of the Altman sisters competing in both K1 and C1. Here she is in C1. These Potomac Whitewater Racing paddlers, really talented. Um, you know, Marcella, her sister, putting down a spectacular run earlier in K1. And Isabella, you can see just a very determined style, not rushed, not worrying about, you know, frantically paddling through. Um, does drift a little wide into gate 10. It's a little caught out by the power of the wave down here at 11. But again, these young junior paddlers just gaining experience. Drives out, gets over to 13, does a paddle switch right at the top of the wave, wave and she is off and running through the course and she's making the gates just making it look good her kayak run earlier was really good really good to watch and uh, I would love to see these paddlers develop over the next few years it's going to be great to see how they build up into uh, more experienced competitors she opts for that spin as a sensible move it means that she doesn't have to risk it too much as we join her older sister Marcella at the top of the course she drives her head back Looks like it was a, a pretty solid move. Hopefully the judges aren't too critical on that. Nice switch as she drives across that compression wave and over through to seven. Pretty pretty solid run so far. Nothing crazy. Again, the style differences between these paddlers. You can see that they're measured and very... Uh, sort of predetermined the way they're going about it. The, the Altman sisters are both have this slow, methodical style. Uh, while it looks like it maybe is a little too sedate, you can tell by their times that they are moving that boat through and, and they're not slow. So it's just a matter of how they use the water. And some of the top paddlers in the world in the C C1 division uh, always think about the legendary Slovakian c oneers Just this very slow, very lumbering style. And then you see the time at the end of the run, and they've absolutely crushed it. So it's, you know, looks can be deceiving, and it looks like the Altmans are taking inspiration from that Slovak style. And uh, hopefully they'll be competing against some of them this year in Europe against those really good European juniors. As we come back up to the top, Lois Batteridge just really doing well through that move didn't get to see her do gate 4 and 5 seemed that she did well slightly speedier style shorter strokes not quite as uh, ponderous as necessarily the Altman sisters but equally as effective and, uh, and please don't think that I mean ponderous as in uh, a negative way it's just they're just very predetermined Nice little duck through 13. Does an interesting like hand switch and also a drive into the hole there. Uh, maybe high risk because if you end up getting that a little off time, you drop dropping into a really big feature with nothing in the water. And uh, and that was excellent to see. Lois coming from Canada. Again, a, a really good lineage of C1 paddlers and their coaches, both sea boaters. Again, these guys are kneeling, single blades. She goes direct. Oh, see moments like that you just have to sit back and enjoy what you're watching that was skills and Evie Liebfarth our final competitor quite frankly our uh, shoe in for the C1 women in the US team Evie just quietly confident she's going to have to get back to Europe compete with some very high class ladies I know she's going to be looking at people like Jessica Fox and Victoria Ooze from uh from Europe and, and just looking at these ladies and like, alright, how can I beat you? You know, uh, unfortunately we're still still developing some of these junior paddlers, so the depth over here her top end skill is absolutely phenomenal, but she's going to be back over to Europe 
in order to train with the best and ensure that she can prepare as best as she can for Paris. That was glorious. So far she's putting on a masterclass for us. Really big edge because she knows that she's coming out a little low, so she has to adapt to that. Smooths the move at, at, at 13. And Evie's just got such a good feel for the water. You know, she's light but powerful. And what a wonderful combination for a developing athlete. She's really just moving into the senior ranks. Uh, you know, still a junior on the 20 under 23 level. She's a junior world champion, uh, multiple medal winner on the World Cup circuit, and is looking to add an Olympic medal to her trophy cabinet. Ah, oh, spectacular move over from 18 to 13 or 19. There's mo moments like that. You're just happy to watch it, sit back and enjoy. That you're just watching one of the sport's future legends, Evy Liebfarth. U.S. paddler, super proud to represent her nation. Every time I see her dad, he's always got a smile on his face. And uh, Lee and Jean are very proud of what their daughter is accomplishing on the world circuit. And uh, that brings our conclusion to the uh, C1 women. Um, don't really have to look at the results right now. Evie is leading, and she will be, barring any acts of gods or meteors, she is going to be the Olympic boat for C1 women in Paris 2020, uh, 2024. We've got Evie Liebfarth in first, Lois Betteridge in second, Marcella Altman in third, uh, Isabella Altman in fourth, and, uh, and unfortunately they cut away, so I'll come back for the rest of the results here shortly. But a great, great example of paddling. And oh, we've got Carden Otting, the young junior, and Emily Lariche having some issues up there, but still putting down a run and, and doing her best. So she's going to go back, work in her skills in Charlotte before she goes to Oklahoma for the trials out there. But Evie Liebfarth, well, she doesn't really have too much to worry about right now. She is now going to look forward and focus on going to uh, going to the Europe and getting to. Uh, getting to uh, Paris in the best condition she can. So coming up for the men's C1, we've got Ian LaRiche, Cody Linderman, Josh Gavert, and these are our young athletes that are kicking off our men's C1 um, competition. Now, interestingly enough, um, the men's C1, so unfortunately the men's K1 did not qualify the spot. Evie Liebfarth after this weekend really does look like she's wrapped up the women's competition both in K1 and C1. Obviously we've still got another event to happen in Oklahoma in two weeks. But Montgomery, Alabama have really hosted what is just the key trials. They get to kick it off and uh, what a, a job of hosting they've done. But um, men's C1... Casey Eichfeld and Air Zach Locken are locked in a battle royale for that uh, Olympic berth for men's C1. Now, both of them have been to the Olympics. Zach went in 2021 in Tokyo, just pipping Casey out. Um, but uh, Casey has been to several as well. He's been to Rio, to London, and to Beijing. So, a level of experience. But you've got the young upstart, Zach Locken, and we're kicking off with Ian LaRiche, based out of Charlotte, doing a really good job navigating gate one, two, and three. A deceptively challenging section of gate. Swings his bow around. That's what we want to see, Ian. That's what your young Charlotteans are capable of. And he's not scared. Oh, really high on the stern. Catches it on the ball. That is the danger of putting the bow too high up in the air. This course is not deep in all places, so he can catch the riverbed, and that's exactly what he did. But he's recovered well. Um, looks like he's just powering back down. His coach, Wes Bolliard, another Charlotte local, who I had the pleasure of coaching in his younger years, has, has now tipped his hat into the ring for coaching and is working with these young athletes. And looks like Ian has, has some skills. Looks like he's riding a bull out there. He just hasn't quite tamed it yet. You can tell that he knows what he's doing, but he is raw. There's like an unchiseled block of granite that just needs to be smoothed out. And uh, we'll be working on those skills going into 
his future competitions. But these these are young athletes. They're uh, not super old. They have a tremendous amount of time ahead of them to work on those skills. And uh, been a little messy, but you can tell that he has some foundations and is not scared to hang it out there. Goes for the direct move deep into 17. Swings it around. Doesn't leave anything up to chance on that. That was a sensible approach. And after some of the more wild paddling up top, um, it was good to see him using his common sense on that one and just playing it safe. We've got Cody Lindemann from Florida getting a little eager coming into the eddy at four. Gets spun around. And what I mean there is gate four is so deep into the eddy that if you approach it too aggressively, come in too early... That current there is so powerful, it's just going to spin you right around and you're going to be left with a lot of work to do as Cody doesn't quite catch the compression wave. Over to six and he is getting pushed down a little bit, or seven, and he's getting pushed down. So it's uh, really nice to see what we've got. A little touch of the shoulder there on gate eight. Cody using this experience to work his way up the ranks. And he's a young paddler, he's one of the juniors. And uh, it's just all a matter of gaining that experience as he works his way into the more senior ranks. Clatters through gate 11, drops a little low on gate 12, but he's working his way back up. You know, taking a nice wide approach, making sure that he gets over to 13. No issues there. He's back through. A really, really good approach. And uh, it's... Um, Good to see him just kind of keeping on down this course. I think he's been working hard. His coach has been working with him for the last few years. And he paddles a lot with Eli Halbert, another legendary sea boater. More on the white water side of things, but also experienced. Knows what he's looking at and can give some phenomenal feedback. So as Cody comes to the bottom of the course, just taking his time setting himself up for that awkward little bounce move. You really want to catch that river right shoulder, get onto the back, sort of up on top of the hole, don't get too buried in the pit. Over to 19. And we are back up to the top with another one of our Canadian juniors here practicing, Josh Gavert. Really good to see them out here. And we are enjoying seeing what they can do. It's a good opportunity, again, just got... A lot of powerful water here in Montgomery. Uh, the Montgomery Whitewater course. Very varied. It's, it's, it's Some of these courses that you go to, the water can be very homogenous. It's like you go to the top section of the course, it feels the same as the bottom section of the course. Whereas the course designers and Scott Shipley and the engineers, as Josh just comes a cropper, decides that he needs to cool off a little bit in this Alabama sun. Um... But the course designers have, have, have used a lot of experience over the years and, and taken uh, taken some inspiration from different places. And so the course has sort of a, a different geography as you go down. You've got a, a wonderful, tight, fast-flowing offset section at the top, uh, a mellow, a meandering section through the middle before you drop into the powerful water of the cauldron at the amphitheater as Riker Harris just throws his bow up into the air wonderful and dynamic gets stalled at oh misses the wave has to drop off he was so close to just styling that but he just didn't quite get the pop through the turn his edge caught and he gets stalled out ever so slightly at the uh, at the wave and we're going to see him drive back up through to gate 8. So unfortunately, while he had a pretty spectacular top section, the uh, gate 6 just giving him some issues. So he's going to have to regroup, focus on what's coming downstream, and uh, you can tell he's got skills. That's not, not his issue, but it's putting them all together. And for anyone that watches sport or partakes in sport, it's all about getting that foundation making sure that you can do what you need to do, but then putting it together in a race run with the stress, the minute someone says go, God, it's hard to tame the beast, and you just want to throw it all out there, and unfortunately, sometimes a little self-control goes a long way. So Riker just coming a cropper on this middle section, 
And as we were talking about a little bit, the power of this cauldron in the amphitheater, really impressive. But he's he's giving it a go. Riker's no quitter. He's not throwing any tantrums. He's just keeping it moving. And he is going to use this bottom section of the course just to practice some moves and ensure that he understands what it means to reset your brain. And a beautiful little move through 17. Quite high. It does take a little stern tap on one of the obstacles, but nothing too crazy. As we're back up to the top with uh, Diddy Pathile. And he's again one of these DC juniors coming out of the Potomac Whitewater Racing Club that they should just be so proud of what they've built up there. It's really wonderful to see the legacy. We've got so many former US team paddlers that came out of the Potomac Whitewater Racing Club. And this next crop of juniors are uh, really, really solid. I mean, if, if all went well for the current seniors, the uh, entire men's senior team would be Potomac Whitewater Racing Club. But we've got a couple of pretenders in there that are going to make them fight really hard for that. So Diddy's doing a great job working through the amphitheater. And really love what the course designers and course builders have done here at Montgomery with that natural rock embedded in the river right bank. Gives a gives it a really nice feel. Great place to sit, watch the athletes come down, and uh, maybe go get yourself an adult beverage up there at the eddy here at Montgomery Whitewater. I know uh, their general manager here, Philip Melton, will make you feel very welcome. You've got Dave Hep, their CEO, who... Uh, has helped open this facility. Scott Shipley, the designer. Uh, Peggy, the marketing. And actually the woman that really drove the entire development for Mon Montgomery Whitewater to be in Montgomery. She uh, spearheaded that whole project and is now intimately involved with the continued development. So, you know, this was not just a, a project that was plopped down unannounced. This was a, a kind of a... A village approach. Everyone in Montgomery got behind the facility. Support from the Air Force, support from the Chamber of Commerce, support from businesses, and uh, everyone that's worked so hard to get Montgomery Whitewater built and opened. Uh, you should be so proud of yourself. I mean, I've been to a lot of these facilities around the world, and this one is an absolute jewel. Um, you should be very, very proud of what you have, and I look forward to coming back and, and paddling here again. But, so you've got Current paddler on course. I apologize, I missed most of his run waxing lyrically about Montgomery, Alabama, but hopefully you can forgive me. And we're back up with Luca Bond. These younger paddlers. He put on a very good run earlier on. And we'll see, unfortunately, getting a little unstuck here in the. Uh, in the eddy going out to eight, gate number five, got pushed back into the main float or back into the eddy. And so he has to do a little bit of a loop around. So not necessarily where you want to be. These young paddlers out of Colorado really do have to. And if anyone's listening from Colorado, please let me know who the coach is. I apologize for not knowing, but I'm going to give you a pat on the back for producing a, a lot of really solid juniors that you can see what development you've been doing and I'd love to chat with you and just learn more about your program for the future because I really do hope that we're going to see these Colorado kids just continue to develop and, uh, and and grow into really phenomenal paddlers as Luca just gets a great skip, does get a little stalled up on the eddy line, but he, again, it's just, you can see the fundamentals are there. It really is a wonderful example of a young paddler who is paddling at an event that is very challenging. I can attest after having done a demo run on Friday night, these gates are positioned in very, very challenging places. So the, the level of skill it takes to run a course like this and make it look as good as Luca does right now is, is very challenging. But he is in and out of 16. Let's see how he does on the cross. Doesn't get his bow caught. Drives over and unfortunately we cut away up to Alden Henry from DC, or Connecticut, I apologize, and uh, Alden's been around for a while, he's a solid paddler, understands what he's doing, represented the US at, at some competitions over on the continent, and uh, 
He's going to have a throat singing dirge in his head as his passion for Mongolian folk rock has uh, grown over the years. Holden just keeping this conservative. He's not done anything cr crazy. Does have to struggle a little bit to 13, but controls that well. Has to spin 15. And all that is is a matter of him being just a little bit behind the line where he wanted to do. So he's having to make up space in order to get to that next gate. So that was a, not plan A, but he handled plan B very well. Switches up into 16. Gets the cross through. Let's see how he does out. Hopefully not get pushed back. Drive over. Has to duck under 17. Takes it to the back of the head. And we'll see what the judges tell us about that. But we are coming up to the top of the course. And we've got Tyler Gavert, another one of our Canadian paddlers, here working on skills. And again, unfortunately, just doesn't quite get the drive out into the flow. Uh, that's a wonderful example of just how powerful this course is. You've got water just pushing you away from the wall. And same thing, almost gets, it kind of gets his head under there, takes the pole to the back of the, the body. But, um, you know, again, just not making it into the center of the boat, having some errors, touches gate seven again with the bow of his boat. And things are getting a little squirrely. Use this middle, middle part of the course to just gain your composure back and, uh, and understand where you are. So as you come back into the challenging section of the, the cauldron, Taylor is resetting, gets a great little bounce out of gate 11, drives into that current that you can see running up the wall, and that's that eddy current. It's, it's a conveyor belt. Um, I'm sure there's hydrologists and physicists out there that can talk all about the Bernoulli effect and hydrodynamics, and I just say it gets sucked back up, and, but... You, see where that current is and these cur these paddlers are using those currents to their best advantage um, some of the gates are completely set where the current is not going to help you and the skill really is learning how to use that unfortunately doesn't quite get 17 gets rejected by the stopper has to scoot around so while Taylor this young Canadian again ah oh, flips over rolls back up no issues no worries but is probably going to be less than happy and yeah, you can tell that he's frustrated. I think he's probably sacked that one off. And uh, well, we'll get back up top with Isaac Zimmerman. One of our chief timers has just put in my hand the official results from the K1 men. So this has been ratified by the chief judge. And so no changes. You've got Michael Smolin in first by only nine one hundredths of a second to Joshua Joseph. A very, very good um, result there from Josh and Tyler Westerfall pulling it back in line he's in first place third place uh, Tyler really needed that yesterday he had not had a good result so he absolutely needed to get back on track in order to cement his position within the US team and hopefully he's done that Merle Long in fourth place Merle where'd you come from I know that you paddled well but that was a heater of a run that you put down in in uh in the second runs and so Merle while you're representing Australia um, gone to our Antipodean cousins um, that was still an excellent result and we're back on with um, Isaac from Canada oh, just taps 20 a little bit Isaac had a wonderful cross and we're back up to the top with Devin McEwen and Devin stylish young gentleman with that stash Shaved it in. Doing it for Dale. Every once in a while you got to rock the Intimidator. And Devon, one of the kindest human beings out there on the circuit. I know his family are going to be so proud of him. Keeping the McEwen name involved in paddling at such a high level after his father and uncles have absolutely dominated the 80s and 90s era of paddling and uh, Devon just styling through 12 I mean it's interesting Devon not always the most consistent in slalom but when he has the ability to put down a solid run he is a very very stylish paddler to watch and he is just making sure that he's hitting all his lines it looks like he's putting on a beautiful 
example of paddling right now. What's nice about Devon is it's nothing too crazy. And got a beautiful cross there. He's a traditionalist. He doesn't switch hands. That's what we like to see every once in a while. I'm not dissing switching because it is fast, but uh, pretty sure that Devon's... Uh, Devon's dad would maybe giving it a little bit of a raised eyebrow if he switched hands. But now we've got Nathaniel Francis. Had some issues in his first run, so let's see where he does in run two. Much better there. That was one of the issues that he had earlier on, just getting pushed wide at gate six. Does come in contact with gate seven a little bit. Looks like he left some work for the judges. Nathaniel has been on the circuit for such a long time came as just a very very young paddler to Charlotte when we uh, we got to see him start paddling He's working with the Potomac Whitewater Racing Club and uh, had an opportunity to chat with his mum at lunch and she's just so proud of her son oh, thinks that he didn't get it knows that he needed to not leave that up to the judges discretion so circles back around that's a risk that he has but uh, you know he knows what he's doing he's uh, coming back from some adversity and still just putting down good solid runs. A um, couple of errors there, but nothing too crazy. And this was what gave him some trouble on the first run. And no, he's not going to make this same mistake twice. Goes back across. Beautiful through 17. That is a redemption run if ever there was one. Because that was a pretty catastrophic um, move earlier there. Beautiful over to 19. Wonderful on that upstream side. Ducks through 19. And yeah, you can just see shades of, you can just see shades of, uh, of previous paddlers there. Going to go straight back up to the top. We've got Casey Eichfeld, a uh, wonderful paddler out of Pennsylvania in the early days, but moved down to Charlotte in 2008 to train for the Olympic trials there for his first Olympics where he went to Beijing. Beautiful in there. Ooh, nice. Doesn't stall up. Use checks a little bit of the hole. That's going to hold him up just slightly, but he's back on target. And we are watching Casey get back online. The neck and neck with Zachary Locken right now, and that is power. Casey is such, such a strong individual, so skillful. And nice and deep into set into 12, doesn't lose any time, drives out to 13. I know his wife Sarah and his daughter Emmy are going to be cheering him on. And it's so wonderful to see this family man just, just keep on training. You know, he's got... A lot of responsibility on his shoulders with his family, and he is still paddling at such a high level. He's medaled at world champion or at world competitions. He's been always in the final. Beautiful 17 move from Casey. Right on the edge. No Zach's nipping at his heels. Just slightly far ahead after run one. But we are. Oh, quick pivot. Wonderful. Brings his bow just in time to make sure that he doesn't hit 21. Ducks in and out of gate 22. And now it's the final sprint down to that finish as we rejoin Zach Locken of Colorado. Durango, Colorado. Although hangs his hat in Charlotte, North Carolina to make sure that he can train regularly at Whitewater. Zach crushing that move on the quick surf across. Doesn't get hung up. Casey did use a little bit more time at gate 7-8. As Zach just storms down into this bottom section of the course. Let's see what the timing's doing for us. It looks like Casey is very close, but still ever so slightly behind Zach's first run time. Beautiful from Zach. Absolutely creams gate 12. He drives over into the hole, penetrates that beautifully. And he is cranking down through this middle section. You are seeing a masterclass of C1 paddling right here from Zachary Larkin actually in the broadcast booth with his brother Will and that was glorious nothing fancy right there just very measured beautiful on 17 barely looked like he did anything that was spectacular just slid it right through no effort whatsoever oh I love to see this oh you can see him just pull his shoulder out of the way Ah, real quick duck just passes the ear inside of gate 21 deep into 22 let's see how he does a sprint to the line can he better his first run time that was an absolute heater of the run and is he there 
Oh, doesn't quite beat his first run time, but he has a quite a large advantage. Yesterday, Casey beat him by five tenths of a second into first place, but currently Zach is now leading day two by three and a half seconds. So the point system is done on percentages. So we'll see how that all works out. Uh, going into the final day but that concludes uh, US Olympic team trials for canoe and kayak slalom held here at the beautiful Montgomery Whitewater facility uh, for the slalom discipline the traditional slalom discipline of kayak slalom now these athletes are going to be lining up a little later on for the head-to-head -head, what's known as the boat across and there we have it confirmation or unofficial confirmation that Zachary Larkin has bested Casey into first place. And that margin is not insignificant. Uh, again, Casey won yesterday, but by a much slimmer margin. So that margin is going to play into Zach's favor. Uh, Nathan, uh, Nathaniel Francis there in... Uh, oh, sorry, that just changed into fifth. Uh, had a couple of, couple of errors, but we've got Isaac Zimmerman in third, Alden Henry in fourth. And Nathaniel Francis in fifth, Devin McEwen in sixth, Ian LaRiche in seventh, Tyler Gavert from Canada in eighth. And uh, well, that is a very interesting, interesting result for Zach. Now we go basically head to head into Oklahoma, and that is going to put a lot of pressure on um, on uh, on Casey going in there because he's got a margin to wake up. Now, these are the official results leading into the uh, the C1 ladies. So, Evie Liebfarth, um, again, she has punched her ticket. She is going to the Paris 2024 Olympics, barring any meteors or earthquakes. Um, but she is going to the Olympics. So, thank you very much for joining us here at the U.S. Olympic Team Trials here in glorious Montgomery, Alabama. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in with us. And just one final thank you, not only to our viewers at home, the volunteers, the officials, the judges, the hosts. Montgomery is a city. And uh, I wish you adieu. And uh, good night from us here in Montgomery Whitewater.